Buenos, buenos días a todos. Seguimos con, la, con el, el último día de las jornadas y que vamos ya con la última sesión en la que vamos a tener unas conferencias plenarias a cargo de Gordon Clark y Frederick Glasser, que estoy segura os van a encantar. Y eh, después procederemos a la clausura y a la entrega de la medalla Instituto de Ciencias de la Construcción Eduardo Torroja. Entonces, sin más, doy la palabra a Mari Carmen Andrade, que va a presentar a Gordon Clark. Thanks, Marta. Uh, I am going to introduce Gordon Clark in, in English. Uh, uh, Gordon Clark is director of Rumble in the UK and is also the president of FIB. The FIB is uh, very well known for some of you, or maybe all of you, but there are some of you that maybe don't know, and there are those in the TV that maybe don't know, is the International Association of, uh, of for is uh, for the beton, but uh, in this case is for a structural a structural concrete, and uh, Eduardo Torroja was an active member and a founder of FIB. Maybe he will say also. Uh, Gordon has been uh, working primarily in bridges and highways. He is a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Institution of Structural Engineers and his early experience was in concrete and steel bridges and especially in post-tension concrete. He joined Gifford in 1976 and was head of civil engineering from 1999 uh, to 2007, following which he became chairman prior to the acquisition by Rumble in, in 2011. He was project director of the award winning Gateshead Millennium Bridge, which has become an icon around the world. He has been very much involved in all about pre-stressing and especially in grouting and the durability of the grouts. Uh, he is currently president of FIB from 2013-2014, this year, and serves on several technical committees and working groups. In the UK, he is chair of the British Standard Structural Concrete Committee, is like our uh, here the, the committee for the, the 140 the codes for the for the codes and is a non-executive board director of CARES that also is well known from our institute because it's the certification authority for reinforcing steel our all heat seed that they have there. Okay, many thanks for accepting Gordon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Carmen. Um, uh, I hope uh, I will speak loud enough for you all to hear me. Um, I'm very pleased to be invited to come to Madrid. Um, uh, I think it's my first visit to Madrid, actually. Um, so it's very exciting for me. Um, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. I, um, I thought that I would uh, congratulate the Institute, and uh, I, I had the pleasure of, of five years ago in London um, uh, meeting Eduardo Torres' son uh, at, the, at the FIP FLB Symposium, where an award was made uh, in, in honor of Eduardo Torres uh, at our symposium. I will give you a little short introduction to FIB, and then follow that by uh, my personal views um, of the challenges for structural concrete uh, in the time that I have available. Um, as Carmen has said, FIB uh, is the International Federation for Structural Concrete, or in French, Fédération Internationale du Béton. Um, it was created in 1998 by merging two um, older organizations, CEB and FIP, both of which were founded in the early 1950s. Um, and that makes us really just over 60 years old, not, not as old as the Toroja Institute, um, and uh, well, I'm sure we will still be around in another 20 years, but we are 60 years old. So we're very pleased about that. And just reflecting on what's happened during those years, um, it, it's quite amazing that to see the world population has increased by 2.5 times uh, between uh, 1950 and, uh, 19, 1953 and 19, uh, 2013, um, now somewhere over 7 billion. But in our industry, the cement production has gone up by 15 times. This is something to, 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 to think, I mean, it is obvious, is it not, that you know, we are becoming 
um, industrialized. Concrete in the world has therefore gone up six times per capita over that period. It's become an essential material to society. Um, and it's an estimated $1.2 trillion sector, which actually is 1.5% of the world's gross domestic product. And in some countries, like China, much more than 1.5%. So we have a very important role, us in the concrete industry, to share our knowledge. And I've just mentioned China, and you can see here that the growth in the red part of the graph uh, has been the growth in cement production uh, in China. Um, compared with all other countries of the world there in blue. It is quite remarkable. Obviously, there are concerns about the CO2 emissions and the effect on the climate, um, uh, and uh, cement does produce CO2 in its production, but I think this graph helps to put it into perspective, um, which shows in the thin blue line uh, is the, the increase in cement production and the proportion of the world's emissions which it uh, uh, produces. Uh, so we are not the worst offenders, but we must make sure we make cement environmentally friendly. Over those 60 years, we've had some, uh, a few presidents' uh, names here I put up on the, on the screen, um, one of which between 1958 and 1961, Irade um, uh, and uh, you can see that we have had some very, very important and well-known um, people as presidents of FIB, uh, CEB and P FIP before that, and I'm very proud to um, uh, be taking the platform uh, as president now. Uh, and uh, uh, as I say, Eduardo Torroja there, uh, 1958 to 61. I managed to find their photographs. Uh, this amuses me, this photograph, because to start off with, they're all very serious people. Um, uh, and it's only more recently that they've started smiling a little bit more. Uh, maybe it was very, even more stressful being an engineer 50 years ago, I don't know. But uh, uh, you can see here, this is deep in contemplation, very deep in contemplation, with some structural problem, I imagine. He was a truly great engineer and innovator, and uh, I, from, from reading what I've read, uh, an amazing person. President of Rylem in 1951, uh, and, uh, indeed, a co-founder of both CEB and FIP. Uh, and one of his great friends was, was Eugene Fresnay, who, in fact, was president of FIP immediately before him. Um, so I'm very proud and honored to be in this, in this uh, uh, building today uh, to make the presentation. Of course, Spain has something look, to look forward to. Um, and uh, FIB is extremely proud that uh, Hugo Correz Peretti has been elected to be the president uh, in 2017-2018, um, and uh, uh, we offer our congratulations to, to Hugo for that, and that will continue the Spanish tradition. Um, there have been several honors and events um, connected with FIP and uh, FIB, CEB, uh, and I put some up on the screen here. I won't read them all out, but there's some very, very um, important uh, um, honors being given. And we really do like having a very strong relationship in FIB with the, the Spanish group. The structure, for those that don't know, is fairly simple. Essentially, we do technical work, um, but we have to be governed. So we have a general assembly, we have a technical council, which rules over the, the technical work, um, and a presidium, which is effectively the board of directors, and then lots of technical committees. This is our current presidium. You can see that uh, we are represented in all continents of the world, uh, and we try to make sure that that, that happens, um, so that we truly try to reflect the opinions of people engaged in concrete from all corners of the planet. The aims and objectives are fairly obvious and fairly straightforward. Uh, the bottom, it says, sharing knowledge in structural concrete, but effectively it's taking it from stimulating research, synthesizing those findings, transferring them into design and construction practice, and disseminating all that knowledge um, uh, by producing recommendations and guidance. And I'll explain a little about some of our publications. Our members are people from right across the concrete industry, academics and suppliers, designers, clients and contractors, and institutes, very important, um, and professional institutions. Our main statutory members are our national member groups of the countries, uh, as well as corporate and individual members. And we actually have FIB countries represent 85% of the world's gross domestic product, 
um, in 60 countries. We have 43 national member groups. We strive to get more. We are having, I think, three more potentially joining um, in the next year. Um, we're currently discussing with. Uh, the Spanish member group is supported by ACHG. We're very pleased to have that support. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the members, current members of the Spanish delegation uh, here from our most recent directory. I mentioned the General Assembly. Uh, that contains all our national, de national member group delegates, about 75 people, uh, which essentially controls the election of officers and budgets um, and the approval of our model code. It's a, a little bit like the United Nations. It looks like this was the latest one in February, but I'm sure it's much more friendly than the United Nations. We don't tend to argue very much. Um, it's a, a very friendly group of people. Um, important for our technical work is the Technical Council, which consists of the heads of each national member group, the chairs of each commission, and our honorary presidents. And there's about 60 people. And their job is a very important one. It, it, it's about initiating uh, and approving technical work. <coughs> we had a recent technical council meeting in Shanghai two months ago uh, in September, um, and uh, here are the group of about 35 people who attended uh, that, that, uh, that meeting, very successful, including um, uh, my friend Hugo Corres. Uh, they're looking very happy, uh, probably looking forward to a Chinese lunch. <coughs> Our technical organization, we have commissions which are permanent, and we have task groups and working groups which are mostly temporary, and they are established with a specific remit and deliverable. This is too much to take in in one go, but uh, this essentially shows uh, that we cover every topic we can think of uh, in terms of um, structural concrete. Uh, and it's important to remember it's structural concrete. We, we, we focus on, on the delivery and and the production and the design and construction, as well as the properties which um, are important as well. Our work is um, published in uh, bulletins. Our latest one, in fact, is, was just being published now, Tall Buildings, uh, Structural Design of Concrete Buildings Up to 300 Metres Tall. We identified a, a gap in the market um, for design guidance on conceptual design and the important engineering uh, aspects. There was no, no publication uh, as far as we could see internationally. So this is a very important uh, document being produced um, and uh, uh, published as our bulletin number 73. That is of FIB bulletin number 73. In fact, uh, over history we've produced about 400 um, bulletins uh, over the 60 years. This is one of the important <coughs> ones, a five volume structural concrete textbook which has all the background information in it uh, as the basis for our model code. Um, very, uh, very good document. And uh, also our Structural Concrete Journal, which is published quarterly. And this contains peer-reviewed papers um, and some background information to the, um, the model code. Model codes are important um, for people to uh, use where they are developing new codes or where there is no code at all covering what they want uh, to do. And, and the history goes right back to 1964 when the first CEB international recommendations for design of reinforced concrete were published. Um, in 1970, uh, these were expanded to include pre-stressed concrete um, as a joint publication. Uh, and the first model code was produced in 1978. Uh, 1985, a model code for seismic design was produced. And importantly, in 1990, what became the forerunner of the current Euro code, the concrete Euro code, was based upon this. In 2006, we published a model code for service life design, which is now coming increasingly important. And in 2010, the first draft of our model code for concrete structures, which was published in hardback in 2013. And this is now uh, spreading around the world. Our member, all our member countries have copies of it. Um, it's a guiding document, really, for new codes. It, will, it is already being used for development of the next revision to the Concrete Euro Code for the year 2020. Very important uh, and uh, a fantastic piece of work. And when you think about what has changed over those 20 years, amazing amounts has changed. Interest in service life design, concern about in existing structures, significant increases in concrete strength, uh, uh, new special types of concrete, 
powerful computers, uh, and sustainability has become so important. We're reducing empiricism through much more knowledge of, of experience, uh, and more emphasis on conceptual design uh, and choice between using simple or advanced models. That's probably enough about FIB. You can keep in touch even if you're not a member by um, getting our electronic newsletter and our quarterly newsletter, FIB News, which are all available uh, at this website. So, <coughs> from my experience, this is my personal view on challenges for structural concrete for the future. There are several things that are becoming increasingly important with our crumbling infrastructure. Uh, everything we build, we want to be sustainable. Everything we build, we want to be durable. And I would put to you, we need it to be adaptable so that it lasts a long time. Because if it's not adaptable, we will continue to demolish buildings that are only 20 years old, and we will continue to have to widen bridges that are only 20 years old. We should think about adaptability. And we learn from experience, and that's why research is important. We research, we innovate, and we produce better and better materials. During my travels in the last two years, I've listed here the places that I've been to, some of them more than once, uh, and it's been very interesting because I've seen some recurring themes um, uh, uh, in visiting these places, and one of those uh, has been tall buildings, and our cities, are, our population is increasing dramatically, and most of our cities are, are, are building up and up, and I see in Moscow, in Madrid here, just nearby, uh, some very interesting new tall buildings. I was in Moscow in, this summer, I'm quite taken by Stalin's vision just after the war, and he built seven tall buildings, one of which, in fact, was the tallest in Europe, uh, there on the left, Moscow State University, until uh, 1990. And these are quite amazing architectural buildings, and they are iconic, uh, and I'm sure that they will, be, they will last. In the background on the right, however, you can see, if you like, the, the, the threatening new tall buildings in Moscow, which are, in fact, taller and under construction. And you see there the skyline of 320, 330 metre tall buildings uh, in Moscow's business di district. I hope they're durable. I hope that the concrete in them is going to be uh, long lasting. And I hope they will be adaptable for the future because buildings of this tall will be a real problem to demolish and reconstruct in the future. In Dubai, I think everyone knows the, the tiny little needle in the middle there. Uh, which appears tiny because it's so far away. Contrast that with that beautiful mosque in the foreground. But buildings there, 200, 300, 400, and up to over 800 meters um, tall, and everyone is following that trend. In Shanghai recently, uh, almost completed, 630 meters. Um, this is the, uh, the second tallest. Uh, winds from typhoons, huge seismic loading. Big, big challenges for the engineer. Uh, uh, really only made possible by computers and by things that have changed in the last 20 years. But um, you know, th this, is, this is what is happening and, and concrete in hundreds of thousands of cubic meters is being used in these buildings. We need to make sure that it's being used to the very best. I'll take you back. Hennebeek was a very famous pioneer of reinforced concrete. And uh, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, he, he patented a lot of his, his work. And here is a very old bridge, um, beautiful bridge, very, very efficient, very economic, um, built over the River Severn in the Iron Bridge Gorge, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in 1905. And it was built as a toll-free bridge, as a rival to the Iron Bridge, the world's first Iron Bridge, about one kilometer away. Unfortunately, I was responsible for having it demolished in 1994 after 89 years. It wasn't something I relished doing, but we could not repair it because it was um, in flood waters every winter, right up to the road level. We could not make the concrete members any bigger. There was no concrete cover, chloride attack. But when we demolished it, uh, some of the reinforcement was as good as the day it went into it, but it was very weak. Um, so 89 years. Is that long enough? No, not for these sort of bridges. <coughs> these modern bridges that we're building now, we want them to last much longer and very harsh conditions. We have durability models now which are being used, hopefully, to make sure that these last much longer. The Great Belt Bridge there and the Orison Bridge, both completed uh, 
10 or so years ago. Um, and many other large concrete bridges in the world, uh, we are using much more modern techniques. But we have still have a problem. We have built so many elevated expressways and infrastructures in our cities that to repair them is a nightmare. It is impossible. We have traffic on them day and night, incessantly. I've seen common problems in many countries where these are now, some of these expressways are, are built in the 1970s, are needing massive repairs because we have made mistakes in the past. I took this photograph from the top of the Rainbow Bridge in Tokyo, where I was, uh, uh, had the pleasure of being taken uh, on a technical visit. It was very interesting, but you see the massive con congested infrastructure there. How could you ever repair or replace that infrastructure? So it's an example, which is actually a Rambold project at the moment, of a bridge built in 1961, designed by Monsell and Gifford, my former employer. Um, they were both pioneers of pre-stressed concrete at the time. And this is quite a pioneering structure. It's a 700 meter long viaduct in segmental cantilever construction. The concrete is very good and will last much longer. But at 50 years old, the, the bridge has suffered. And it suffered, really, because of its Achilles heel, which is all these joints. You see, it has got double joints. Uh, and this is an absolute nightmare and a real mistake in some cases unless the pre-stressing tendons are protected from leakage of chloride through those joints. And here is a cutaway of the bridge. It is entirely precast concrete. Very innovative at the time, all segmental and very rapid construction. Even the deck uh, beams are segmental. And you can see that it has in situ concrete joints, 75 millimetres in between every single unit. And external pre-stressing, which is grouted in some places in the construction. Unfortunately, uh, they, they, they allowed it to have chloride put on it for uh, de-icing. And the chloride penetrated. The grouting was not perfect. Um, and uh, on inspection, some tendons were found completely broken. And another mistake was made. On the right-hand side there, you can see, just at the top of a photograph there, a drainage pipe carrying the drainage water from the road, which has leaked for many, many years and has dripped water onto the encased tendons underneath, where they are effectively external, unbonded. But they have completely corroded the tendons. So two problems. As a result, the entire pre-stressing is to be replaced. Don't forget, this was the technology in the 1960s to put grout into pre-stressing tendons, pump it like this. Bags of cement and water, nothing else, maybe a little admixture to make it a little bit smoother. But it was very crude technology and um, easy to see why mistakes were made. Other mistakes made in the construction of the bridge. Um, yeah, okay, the bearings were put at the bottom of the piers for aesthetic reasons. They didn't want to see the bearings at the top of the piers, which seemed to, in to interrupt the flow of the, of the architecture of the piers it being integral with the, the deck. But they've been underwater for 50 years. The result of this all is that we have to add additional pre-stressing. There is no space inside the bridge to add more pre-stressing. So innovative techniques being used ultra-high performance fibre reinforced concrete is being used to put new blister anchorages on the sides and soffit of the bridge. These are being tested, full-scale tested, uh, and uh, external tendons added. And gradually, as this is added, the existing pre-stressing will be cut. It's a very complex, very complex procedure. And here you can see the installation of those blisters. This was taken just in August, um, where they have to be connected to the structure. Uh, and at the same time, this bridge is carrying all the traffic. There is no closures. <coughs> in Japan, I also visited this bridge, which has some very new innovations, using fibre-reinforced concrete from some of their experience in corrosion um, and uh, inability to inspect. I'll come back to this one in a moment. Because external post-tensioning was quite commonly used in the 1960s. And here are three bridges from the UK um, which were pioneered at that time. Um, remember, this was all before computers. 
And some of these are, are curved, completely indeterminate structures, um, uh, and uh, they, were, they were effectively designed in the university laboratory using strain gauges and models. But mistakes were made. Here you can see a temporary access hole put in the top slab of this bridge to get access during construction, sealed up, but not properly sealed up, and has been leaking for 50 years with water going onto the tendons encased in concrete. Simple mistake to make. Recommendations now say don't do that. This is um, during construction. You can see here 19... Here, the, the detail of the separator and deviator plate, specially made, so each individual strand was separated. And here, over the pier, where they are all collected together through a pier saddle, <coughs> specially formulated cast steel uh, elements. Really perfect detailing to deflect and deviate the tendons. Very clever designs. But another mistake. And here is a view looking on the top of the bridge decks to that pier saddle. They're going to fill that with concrete and then put the road surfacing on top. But there's no reinforcement coming out of the deck into the concrete that's going to go into the infill. So those joints will leak. We now know that from experience. This is a shame. Here you can see the stressing. This was the very first tendons being stressed on this bridge. Sort of pre-stressing. This other bridge, Bradley Road Bridge in Bournemouth, had longitudinal and transverse pre-stress, uh, built in the 1960s also. Five spans curved with the piers built in. You can see V-shaped piers built into the deck on the right-hand side. Very, very innovative, designed by modelling. Minimal reinforcement in this bridge, simplicity. The bridge, the bridge is still there today, but all the pre-stressing has been replaced. So this replaceability is very important, in my opinion. The longest bridge in Asia, 5.5 kilometers, built in 1982. We know it has some problems. Not so old, very, very poor environmental conditions, and uh, also... perhaps don't know how to properly predict it. Certainly we didn't get it right in the 1980s um, and severe deflection. There is an FIB bulletin, number 33, which is quite uh, 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 useful in informing um, some of the problems where, uh, in bridges where to look for. Um, and this uh, uh, task group has just been formed, in fact, to, to update this bulletin um, after uh, about 15 years um, since it was published. It, I'm sure you, many of you know the problems. It's leaking water, often carrying chlorides. Water is an enemy. Failure of protective systems, poor design details, poor construction, and failure to maintain. But some more examples. This is typical of an urban expressway in a hot equatorial climate. You can see the rusting. Anyone can see that is rust. Now, what is rusting? The, the very thing that holds this bridge up is rusting. It's a telltale sign. 1970s, uh, this in Japan, halving joints cracked, bearings seized. Simple things that could have worked, but are a maintenance nightmare. Bearings underwater. Here you can see bearings absolutely corroded solid underwater. We must learn to stop this happening. In 1992, this is particularly important to me, there was a ban on pre-stressing in bridges introduced in the UK, almost directly as a result of the collapse of this bridge in Belgium, where there was loss of life. And when we look at the reasons for its collapse, we can see, oh dear, it had at each end something completely holding the bridge up, a tendon tie-down behind each abutment, uninspectable, Impossible to see whether it was corroding. We just, the, 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 it was just left there. Unfortunately, that failed and the, the bridge collapsed into the river because it could not uh, resist 
its weight. And here you can see complete failure of the wires. So perhaps what have we learned from this? Well, we can learn all sorts of things about design and so on. And I've picked a few structures out of our FIB Outstanding Structures Awards um, this year of some new structures built um, trying out some new innovative techniques. This bridge in Austria has no reinforcing bars in it. It only has pre-stressing in two directions, completely encapsulated. And this is a tremendous mo uh, move in, in uh, uh, trying it out. There was no need for waterproofing on this bridge deck either. Very good, clever design. We're seeing ultra-high performance fiber reinforced concrete coming in. And these modular footbridges uh, are another development um, which, which were uh, mentioned in, in the awards um, this year. And this amazing shell. Shells, of course, were something been around for many times since the times of Heinz Isler and others. Um, and it's great to see them coming back. This one is 90 meters long and actually is the environmental envelope for a building. Inside it, it's a shopping mall. Um, it's only 100 and 120 millimeters thick. Minimum materials, again, pre-stressing. Um, the interior, therefore, is completely flexible and independent. Uh, should be very sustainable. They can have built a building inside it. I would have liked to have seen inside it a rather more demountable structure rather than a reinforced concrete built, um, building inside it, but that's my own personal opinion. Back to that Japanese innovation, finally. Well, this is um, a, an amazing bridge. It is um, uh, fiber-reinforced concrete webs with no reinforcing steel, um, just some pre-tensioning, um, and uh, in situ top and bottom slabs. The webs are ATMPA concrete, um, fiber reinforced, uh, and here you can see the precast web panels. And the reason for making them in this shape is to let daylight inside the box and to make it easy to construct. They've also used epoxy filled and epoxy coated reinforcing steel in bundles here as external tendons covered in polyethylene. Each individual strand easily visible and inspectable. And they've added additional um, tendons, additional anchorages for potential strengthening in the future at very little cost. You can see how easy to, to, to see everything is inside that bridge. I was quite taken by that. Of course, all innovations have risks and risk of failure, and research must be sufficiently thorough, but innovation should not be stifled by being risk-averse. This is one of the threats of the modern society, that we get risk-averse and don't innovate enough. Of course, I would say that you get the best global knowledge through the FIB Concrete Network, um, uh, but decide who may carry for a responsive client who is prepared to use new ideas, which is particularly the case on this bridge in Japan, the, uh, uh, the uh, Nippon Expressway Company. And uh, just learning from the past, I found in, in um, a, the Gifford Udall pre-stressing handbook of 1951, I think, And I found in the 2014 FIB awards this um, pre-stressed concrete portal building on the right. And I thought, the engineering is the same. It's just the way it's been applied that's different through knowledge, through computers, through the tools available to us. Um, amazing to see. Just finishing then with a couple of um, examples of, 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 of bridges. This suspension bridge built in 1965 now is being replaced because the cables are corroding and it's under strength. It's up in Scotland and a new bridge is being, un being built. It's under construction, being designed to the Euro codes. Let's hope uh, that after only 50 years we won't be doing the same again. Uh, I really hope that the Euro codes are better than the codes that we used in 1965. And here you can see um, an artist's impression uh, of the bridge. The the bridge deck is just uh, being constructed at the moment. And another one which has Spanish involvement in it, Mersey Gateway um, Bridge, 
construction has just started on this. This is a pre-stressed concrete bridge. Um, both of these bridges Rambol are involved in, uh, and both of them are in the UK, and we're really hoping that they're going to be um, durable and with a predicted durability as a, an artist's impression of the underside of the bridge. So, to conclude, what we need for enduring structural concrete. We know we need reinforcing systems and concrete of exceptional durability. We know much better now how to do that. We must have structures which are as adaptable as possible to reasonably foresee changes of use and loading, especially for megastructures which are costing billions of dollars or pounds or euros. And this will require a step change, in my opinion, to life cycle analysis and costing methods. If we achieve these, sustainability is almost automatically satisfied if we make long-lasting structures. And with help from research and practice, our structural concrete will last longer than that of our predecessors. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.